It's like something from a sci-fi movie. A secret, dangerous gas gets released in the atmosphere, breaking it down and allowing deadly radiation from outer space to reach the citizens on this poor, distant planet. Except that planet was Earth, and it only happened about 40 years ago. On this channel, we like to talk a lot about gases in our atmosphere, and for good reason. The atmosphere is the only system on Earth that touches every region on the planet, giving it a huge influence on what life is like on the surface. It keeps us at a comfortable temperature, provides oxygen to breathe, and protects us from radioactive particles coming from our sun and the galaxy. Without it, no life could exist especially if it weren't for one trace gas only found in tiny quantities miles above our heads. Ozone. This bonding of three oxygen atoms is one of the most important gases in our atmosphere, protecting all life near the surface from deadly ultraviolet radiation coming from our sun. Usually, it resides in the upper atmosphere, forming spontaneously and getting destroyed by the UV light, but in the 90s, something started decreasing ozone concentrations, causing a giant ozone hole to form around Antarctica. But why? And how does this help in fixing climate change? First things first, what makes ozone so special? The air we breathe is full of oxygen, O2 to be specific, but ozone acts nothing like this. It sits mostly in the stratosphere, where unfiltered sunlight from space causes O2 to react and become O3. This newly formed ozone acts as a shield for life below it, absorbing the deadliest ultraviolet radiation that it comes into contact with. By the time the light makes it to the surface, most, if not all, of the harmful UV light has been filtered out. Around the 1950s, scientists began analyzing the ozone concentration in our atmosphere setting up the first measurement devices at the Halley Bay Observatory in Antarctica. Using a unique unit of measurement called a Dobson unit, or DU, they found the average concentration of ozone in the atmosphere was 300 Dobson units. However, these levels were not to last forever, as a new gas was finding its way into the stratosphere. About 30 years prior, in 1928, Frigidaire, General Motors, and DuPont had teamed up to find a new alternative coolant to use in their products. The old coolants of ammonia, methyl chloride, and sulfur dioxide were leading to fatal accidents, costing the companies millions. The gas Freon was made to replace it. Freon is what's known as a chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC. This is one or more carbons bonded with fluorine and chlorine atoms in an incredibly stable configuration. This new gas was non-toxic, chemically inert, and affordable, soon becoming the main coolant in every fridge, freezer, and air conditioner. By the 1960s, nearly 1 million metric tons of Freon were being pumped out every year. This seemed like the miracle product DuPont had been searching for. Not only was it a good coolant, but it could be used in other products as well, like hairspray, bug spray, spray paints, basically anything that needed to be sprayed. But once this gas got into the atmosphere, it underwent significant changes to its structure. This gas was designed to be super stable, so it wouldn't degrade into any toxic byproducts. However, this gas was so stable that it couldn't find a way to leave the atmosphere. Every time someone sprayed their hair or tagged a building, this gas was creeping its way up mile by mile into the stratosphere. Here, the same high-intensity sunlight that makes ozone was breaking apart the Freon and allowing its chlorine atoms to be free from the rest. And this meant bad news for the ozone layer. Chlorine is what's known as a catalyst, meaning it can react with things like ozone and not get used up in the process. One atom of chlorine could, on average, react with 100,000 ozone molecules before being removed by other natural processes. And this went on unchecked for years, until 1974, when two University of California scientists 
Professor F. Sherwood Rowland and Dr. Mario Molina discovered that chlorine could do this. It only took another 11 years, in 1985, when the ozone hole first showed its face over Antarctica. Levels had dropped from 300 Dobson units to under 200 in just a decade. Immediately, scientists spread the word, publishing the news about the ozone hole that threatened life as we knew it. They warned that if the production of Freon and other CFCs didn't stop immediately, we could lose a majority of the ozone in our atmosphere, exposing all life to harmful levels of UV radiation. There was initial pushback from DuPont and other manufacturers, stating that there wasn't enough evidence for a cut in production, and that any changes made would be unwarranted and counterproductive. The science had a clear consensus that threatened industrial operations and was trying to be shut down for the sake of continued profits. Sound familiar? The good news is that by 1987, 27 nations had signed the Montreal Protocol to reduce and eventually eliminate Freon from all appliances and products. DuPont eventually agreed with the science and decided to stop producing Freon as its harm to the atmosphere could no longer be avoided. As time went on, more and more nations agreed to the Montreal Protocol, being the first agreement in United Nations history to be ratified by all 197 nations. Today, the ozone hole still exists, but it's showing strong signs of recovery due to all these international agreements. Now, this is a rare uplifting story about environmental damage that shows humanity can achieve a difficult goal when working together. But the ozone hole and the story of the Montreal Protocol have another, arguably more important lesson for us to learn from, which is how to address the issue of climate change. Climate change report just severe threat to America's health and economy. economy. The ozone issue was an example of how international cooperation, while listening to an expert consensus, solved an issue that threatened all life as we know it. The same scenario exists today with climate change, except there is not enough international cooperation to solve it as of yet. But the ozone hole was a much simpler issue. A gas disappearing that protects us from radiation is a pretty easy concept to wrap one's head around. Climate change, however, with all its nuances and feedback loops and side effects with lower certainty, can confuse a lot of people, especially when there's conflicting information in the scientific community. There are three main things we can take away from the Montreal Protocol. One is that images are powerful. Two, time is of the essence. And three, to listen to the experts. The ozone hole's imagery was incredibly powerful, even to the uneducated. Seeing a literal hole open up in the sky made people afraid of letting it grow and pushed lawmakers to find some way to fix it. Climate change, on the other hand, doesn't have the same impact as an ozone hole and uses sad images of distant polar bears going for a swim to convey its message. If more images like this and that are used instead of these, there may be a stronger reaction from the public. More importantly, timing is critical when it comes to these issues. Politicians have been sitting around since the 70s on the issue of the climate emergency, and very little action has been taken. If we are to avoid the worst results, we need to act now. If we had waited around 50 years to ban Freon, there would be little ozone left in the atmosphere today. Finally, we need to trust the millions of experts who agree that climate change is a crisis that threatens all life on Earth in some form or another. Imagine if DuPont back then had the political influence, infrastructure, and money that ExxonMobil, Chevron, and BP have today. Would we have listened to the scientists' warning of radiation from the sun, or would we have wanted to keep our cheap fridges and hairspray just a couple more years? or decades. Even though Freon was incorporated into almost every household, business, and public building, we managed to find replacements for it without giving up our technology. Now we find fossil fuels in every corner of the world, 
and it's now time to take the lessons learned from the Montreal Protocol and apply them to solving the biggest emergency humanity has ever faced. In our next episode, we're going to talk about Earth's forests and how they are one of our biggest allies in the fight against rising carbon dioxide levels. Join the discussion in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends and family to support Planet Zero.